What would cause this pastor to quit preaching to work halfway around the world? And he never went away. I finally said, you know what, I, I, I think you're right. Plus, from building skateboards. I grew up making ramps in the driveway. To building lives. If they're not doing something you know, radical, they're not within God's plan for their life. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Negotiators in Vienna say they almost had a deal with Iran. And now they're not so sure. Disagreements could still derail the agreement. Once final details are hammered out, the agreement will be subject to review by the Senate. And as Chris Mitchell reports, leaders in both Washington and Jerusalem are doubtful any plan will actually succeed. The deal would, in theory, limit Iran's nuclear program in exchange for relief from economic sanctions. After more than two weeks of intense talks and efforts that began more than a decade ago to curb Iran's enrichment of uranium, the world powers seem on the cusp of a breakthrough in Vienna. But here in Jerusalem, one Israeli analyst said the deal was possible only because the U.S. capitulated on almost every key issue of the negotiations. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned the concessions made by the six world powers in Vienna won't lead to peace, but will threaten world peace. Concessions even on issues which were considered as crossing red lines in the Lausanne deal, which is a bad deal on its own. It paves Iran's way to many nuclear bombs and gives Iran hundreds of billions of dollars to its terror and occupation system. And so this agreement is putting at risk the peace of the world. Despite the negotiations in Tehran, Iran's supreme ruler Ayatollah Khomeini said Iran remains an enemy of the U.S. Their President Rouhani led a march where demonstrators burned U.S. and Israeli flags and called for death to America and death to Israel. Back in Washington, Democratic and Republican senators remained skeptical and said so on the Sunday talk shows. We have gone from preventing Iran having a nuclear uh, ability to uh, managing it. Uh, and what we are doing is basically rolling back sanctions uh, for not rolling back Iran's illicit nuclear infrastructure. Well, look, we already know that it's going to leave Iran as a threshold nuclear state. We know that. It appears as if the administration's approach to this was to reach whatever agreement the Iranians are willing to enter into. The Senate will have 60 days to review any deal sent by President Obama. Senator Tom Cotton remains one skeptic. So I think whatever deal comes out of this weekend, it's going to be dangerous for the United States and dangerous for the world. One danger many cite is the fear the deal will set off a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. I think it will. I mean, you know, leaders of a whole number of countries, also uh, Saudi Arabia, also Turkey, have, have spoken, you know, of the possibility or the likelihood of their need to explore their own options. Well, it'll be a much, much more dangerous and volatile region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. It will be a more dangerous region if uh, Iran gets a nuclear weapon. Just imagine a weaponized Middle East with all the various conflicts that have been going on there for decades. Uh, to see nuclear c capability and the use of nuclear weapons would be horrific. Well, U U.S. evangelicals are among Israel's strongest advocates. And this week, a group representing two million Christian supporters of the Jewish state meets in our nation's capital. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Thanks, Gordon. That group, Christians United for Israel, has been watching the negotiations on Iran's nuclear program closely, and that deal will be among the many topics discussed at its annual meeting. Several Republican presidential candidates will voice their support for the Jewish state at the Candidates Forum. We will have an in-depth report on the summit later this week, right here on the 700 Club. Well, oil prices are dropping around the world, and the prospect of a deal with Iran is one reason why. Experts say easing sanctions will allow Iranian oil to enter more world markets, adding to the global surplus. Brent crude, a major benchmark for world oil prices, fell almost 3 percent to $57.30 a barrel, and U.S. light crude fell to $51.59 a barrel. Here in America, gas prices are down nationwide, 
at an average of $2.77 per gallon. That's almost 90 cents below this time last year. The drop in oil prices is also due to the improving situation in Greece. A bailout agreement with the European Union averted a potential global financial crisis. And as a result, international stock markets are up and investors are cheering the agreement. Gary Lane has more. European creditors and Greece have come to terms that may help the country avert a financial collapse and keep it in the Eurozone. Investors and political leaders worry that a Greek exit from the Euro could lead to global financial chaos. But the European Council president announced Monday a crisis has been averted. There will be no Greek exit from the Euro. The decision gives Greece a chance to get back on, the track, on track with the support of European partners. The country apparently won a number of sought-after concessions. Under terms of the bailout agreement, Greece will not have to transfer public assets outside the country. And that's expected to help avert a collapse of the country's banking system. Also, the period for repaying $357 billion in Greek debt is expected to be extended. Spending cuts and tax increases were required for those loans, but Greeks quickly grew tired of the austerity measures, and 61% voted against a plan to secure more loans, which would have required additional belt-tightening measures. Under terms of the new agreement, a third bailout will be granted, but additional austerity measures will be required including pension and privatization reforms. The Greek parliament must give its approval to the bailout plan by Wednesday, and it's likely to be a hard sell for the Greek prime minister. But with a bank collapse nearing, Greece may be running out of options. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. A massive manhunt is underway in Mexico for the man considered to be one of the world's top drug traffickers. Joaquin Guzman escaped from a Mexican supermax prison Saturday night, apparently through a hole cut in the floor of his cell. That hole led to a tunnel complete with ventilation and lights. Curious for his use of tunnels, Sinaloa Cartel has a team of engineers and miners that have built over 100 tunnels between the U.S. and Mexico. Guzman, known as El Chapo, or Shorty in Spanish, heads the Mexican drug cartel that supplies one quarter of all the illegal drugs sold here in the U.S. He spent 13 years on the run after a previous prison break and was captured last year. The U.S. had sought to extradite him to keep him from escaping. U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch has offered Mexico help to arrest him and put him behind bars. Well, hundreds of undocumented immigrants held for deportation and then released were later rearrested. Altogether, 1,800 illegal immigrants committed crimes after being released between January and August of last year, according to the Center for Immigration Studies. It documents more than 8,000 arrests for deportation altogether. Federal agents wanted them held, but they couldn't without probable cause. One release allegedly led to the shooting death of a San Francisco woman where the immigrant has been charged with murder. Christians packed New York Central Park this weekend, many of them bringing their friends to witness a bit of history. Evangelist Luis Palau led the largest Christian gathering the park has seen in nearly 15 years. Our Ephraim Graham was there. The city that never sleeps was even more awake this weekend. At least 60,000 people braved the July heat and united in Manhattan Central Park for City Fest. Jesus says, in the sunset you free, you shall be free and free. Evangelist Luis Palau's latest good news crusade. I've heard pastors, scores of them, come up to me and say, Palau, you don't realize what you and your team have done for New York City. Palau and his team spent three years pulling more than 1,700 New York City churches together to pray and to serve the city's poorest people, schools, and communities. And he is a legend, Reverend Luis Palau. Thank you for all you have done. The work earned the respect of the city's mayor and the attention of some of its most honored athletes, like former New York Yankees Daryl Strawberry and five-time World Series champ Mariana Rivera. I have to speak about the wonders of the Lord in my life. Therefore, I have to share that with everybody they want to hear. Because they are free since Jesus made them free. At 80 years old, Palau preached his first message of hope, restoration, and salvation on the park's great lawn. He was inspired by his mentor, Reverend Billy Graham, 
who was the last minister to deliver a sermon in the park back in 1991. Diane Suber was in that crowd of some 250,000. This is her first time back in the park. I hope more than anything else that people embrace Jesus Christ, that they embrace the truth and that they live it. Because we're living in a time that's pretty scary for a lot of people. And I don't want to see the fear, I want to see the faith. The six hour celebration in Central Park Saturday wasn't Palau's first massive gathering in the Big Apple in recent weeks. He's pretty much lived in the city for the last two months and hosted dozens of services from here in Queens to Manhattan and throughout the five boroughs. Palau's team took over Times Square Friday with a message in music from Christian artists like Mandisa. When people listen to music, they often don't even realize what they're listening to. And so I feel like if we can take music and redeem it and use it, you know, to show people to Jesus, I just think it's another tool that God can use to draw people to him. Well, I don't think you can have a revival without music. Uh, I think music is a, plays a huge role from the beginning in the Bible to today. A revival in New York City is what the newly united churches are praying for and for God. May you give him the courage of David, the wisdom of Solomon, and the fortitude of Esther. To guide their city's leadership. I think the body is revived and when, we, when you see God moving miraculously in the lives of your friends and family members, you know, it revives you and, and an enthusiasm grows, a confidence in the gospel, and we expect it to be like a revival time in the city. We want all of New York to know that God loves them. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. It looked like a great time. Well, for more of what's to come on the 700 Cup, let's go to Wendy. Yeah, John, Ephraim gets all the great assignments. That looked really nice. Well, coming up, Hope Inside, one of the poorest countries in the world. Our goal has always been to take the young people of a country, train them and show them a better way, and let them help change their country. The people behind Reach Your Global share how they're saving lives next. Well, in developing nations, children are threatened by poverty, disease, lack of education, and even terrorists. To combat this problem, one pastor is leaving his church and heading halfway around the world. CBN's Angela Zadopek reports. Growing up in certain parts of the world can be desolate and even dangerous, but you don't see that in the faces of these children. Knowing they have food for the day, a chance at education, or just being loved, a light of hope shines to help brighten their future. But what about countless others who only see darkness? One day, Houston pastor Sal Saberna unexpectedly received a call for help. I called him right here and told him, you need to quit preaching and come to Africa. When Lauren called me, I was in the midst of a capital fundraiser. We're trying to raise about $8 million, trying to buy a piece of land, build a building. And I said, dude, I would love to do that, but I'm so busy right now. And he never went away. I finally said, you know what? I, my, I think you're right. The two men have started the organization Reach Youth Global, or RYG. It's the goal of Reach Youth Global is to fight the lies that can blind our youth by supporting different ministries which can affect their culture today. Our goal has always been to take the young people of a country, train them and show them a better way, and let them help change their country. One example can be found right here in Jinja, Uganda. Welcome to Masha Children's Village. Located on the bank of the Nile River, the Hebrew word Masha means to draw out. Just as Moses was saved, this village was built to draw children out of desperate situations. My family before this was not good. Since so many children come from broken homes, RYG takes care of their needs until they are 18 years old. Then they can hopefully return to their own communities as leaders. I came to Masha Children's Village. They educated me, they loved me. Mm, and, I, and I have friends. RYG's focus is heavily in Africa, 
with their youth regularly facing persecution from terrorist groups. The only thing that's really going to stop that isn't so much what Washington does, but what the kingdom of God does. And we believe that these strategic partners that we have here in Africa can push back that kind of darkness. I'm currently in the Kibera slums, which is one of the largest slums in Africa that Reach Youth Global is working with. They've set up a feeding center and a school for 350 kids, even though there are 1.5 million residents here. By starting each day with singing, prayer, and a meal, the Kibera New Hope Center inspires children to fight against the temptation to get into crime and drugs. We want you to do well in your life. To study hard and do well for other people. And we want you to become the hope of Kibera, the hope of Kenya, and the hope of Africa. RYG is constantly looking for new local partners, knowing the impact that can be made by saving just one child. Recently, in the camp in Tanzania, a young man who had been uh, recruited to Al Shabaab. Uh, attended the camp because a friend brought him and there he gave his life to Christ. That is one less potential terrorist that's going to be murdering people and buying into something that is a lie. Angela Zadapek, CBN News, East Africa. What a wonderful story. Changing the world one life, one village, one city at a time. And if you want to find out more about Reach Youth Glo Global, all you have to do is go to CBNnews.com. Wendy? Still ahead, a mom who chased a buzz, then lost her kids. It was what I wanted and how I wanted it. And if you didn't like it, well, then too bad. Didn't care about getting busted, didn't care about nothing. And the whole time I had two little boys. Hear what crushed her addiction and brought back her family next. Jessie Paris liked to stay high, and she even drank a little on the side. Still, there was something she wanted more than drugs and alcohol, to be a good mother. I couldn't get enough. I would do them any way I could. I would eat them. I would chop them up and snort them. Whatever I could do to get more and more and more. At 16 years old, Jessie Paris found that her mother's anxiety pills and alcohol took the edge off of life. I didn't want to have to deal with anything. I didn't want to have to deal with life. I didn't want to have to have responsibilities or do anything. I just wanted to be messed up all the time. But I told you. As a young girl, Jessie was physically abused by her stepfather. He also abused her mother, who was helpless in stopping the nightmare. My stepdad would come home on drugs and beat us and hold guns to my mom's head while we watched. They divorced when Jessie was in her early teens. The abuse had stopped, but Jessie still had to deal with the pain. Alcohol would bring some comfort, but it also brought out the rage she had been suppressing. If I felt like somebody showed me disrespect, you know, I fought. It was what I wanted and how I wanted it, and if you didn't like it, well then, too bad. For a while, her mother's Xanax and alcohol gave her the buzz she was looking for. Then at 18, it was crystal meth. Loved it. It was an addiction all the way. That's what I wanted all the time. Didn't care about anything else. She spent two years partying and staying high. But when she got pregnant at 20, Jessie felt a sudden sense of responsibility. She quit partying altogether and married the father of her child. And I thought that's, you know, what I wanted at that time. Had a baby and I thought, here's my chance to do what my mom didn't do or couldn't do. It was my shot to show everybody and myself that I could do it. But the joy of having a son and her sense of responsibility quickly faded. It came back, I started drinking, and whenever I started drinking, that led, the first thing I want whenever I start drinking is to go get hot. Within a year, Jessie was pregnant with her second son. Again, she tried to clean up her life, but couldn't. Didn't care about getting busted, didn't care about nothing, and the whole time I had two little boys. 
Jessie's addiction to meth consumed her life. She got divorced and lost custody of her children to their father. She started feeling the pangs of guilt. And I'd look around and think, do I really want this for the rest of my life? And then the thought would be gone, and then, you know, another one would pop in. I want more than this. Little thoughts like that started popping in my head. Meanwhile, her mother had become a Christian. She convinced Jessie to go to church with her. And she actually said, said, I'm praying for you. I'm asking God to do whatever's necessary to you to change you. And it scared me to death. I don't know why, but it did. And I would go to church high. But the drugs couldn't silence her deep dissatisfaction with her life or the guilt that kept rising to the surface. And then my boyfriend at the time had left me and I pretty much just broke and was bawling and come down off of a half, you know, after two weeks and told God that if he thought he could do any better, you know, he could do it. I told him I didn't care if I lived or died, didn't care if I went to jail, didn't care about nothing. But if he could do it, then he can do it. One night, Jessie finally realized what she really wanted in life. But she says, judging by the way she'd been living, it would take a miracle to make it happen. I wanted everybody to leave me alone. I just wanted to be normal and be a mom and do what I was supposed to do, which is shocking. I hadn't wanted that. She cried out to God and asked for help. By gosh, I asked him if he could do any better, and he did. He was just waiting on me that whole time. That next morning, I woke up. I had no addiction. I had peace. I had feelings I had never even felt before. It was just love, and every the world was set right. And it was, it was amazing. I could hear. I could see. I could. It was amazing. Jesse gave her heart to Jesus. When you come from an addiction and you wake up as a brand new person with feelings I can't even explain, you know, you know Jesus is Lord. You know it, there's no denying it. He put it in me. I mean, I had a whole new personality. The first thing Jessie did was call her boyfriend, Scott. Even though their relationship had been off and on for some time, they always wanted it to work. If we're gonna be together, we're gonna have God in our life every day. He said, okay. We've been with Jesus ever since, never looked back, changed our lives completely. A couple of months later, Jesse and Scott married. They got custody of Jesse's two boys. Today, their family of five includes a daughter. Jesse gives God all the glory for what he has done in her life. He just changed my heart. People don't understand that he's still doing miracles today. And if this isn't a miracle, I don't know what is. I couldn't have changed myself like that. He's still doing miracles today. He's still changing lives because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Messiah. And if you pray that same prayer, Jesus, if you could do better with my life, if you could make something of me, here, here I am. Can you use me? Here I am. It's that kind of simple prayer that gets an answer. It's the one that you make with all of your heart. You're not fooling around. You're not playing games with God. You're saying, I've made a mess of it. Can you fix it? Can you help me? Can you change me? And the same thing he did 2,000 years ago, where he took tax collectors, women of bad reputation, he took lepers, he took the outcasts of society, he took them all and said, yes, I want you. I want you to be with me for all eternity. And that's a wonderful promise. And it's the greatest news the world has ever, ever heard. And it's a miracle that lasts. You can see it, you can see it in Jesse's eyes, you can see how she was changed. Here's somebody who was so dedicated to her addiction that she was willing to give up two boys just to stay high. She was willing to do that. And then she realized, I don't want this. This, this is a mess of a life. Can you turn me? Can you change me? And Jesus did that for her. 
Now, what's your circumstance? Where are you in life today? Is it the life you really want? Is it a life that satisfies the desires of your heart? Do you really want to live this way? Well, if you don't, if you want that change, the same thing that happened to Jesse, all you have to do is pray the same prayer. Jesus, if you can make anything of my life, if you can change me, here I am, take me. If this is for you, if this is what you want, don't change the channel, but right now, bow your head, let's pray together, and what Jesus has done for others, he will do for you. He is the Savior. He is known as the friend of sinners. He comes just for you, if you just let him. So let's pray, and let's him, let, let's, let him do what he's done for others. Let's pray together. Jesus. That's right, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you, and I've made a mess of things. And if you can do anything with my life, I want that. So Jesus, forgive me, cleanse me, set me free. And whatever you have for me to do, Whatever that is, I lay down my life and I give it to you. Hear my prayer. Change me. Change me from, from, the, from deep inside and make me new. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for, a, for an anointing of your presence, for a baptism in your love. Let them know that their prayer has been heard and has been answered today. Fill them with your spirit, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that all those who confess with their mouth shall be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What I want you to do is do that. Confess with your mouth and make a toll-free call. 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When you call, I've got a free packet for you. It's called A New Day. And in it is a CD teaching. What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? What do Christians believe? I also encourage you to get a copy of the Bible, and just as Jesse did, say, I want Jesus in my life every day. And one of the best ways to do that is to read your Bible every day. I also want you to join a local church. But start with that phone call. Make it right now, 1-800-759-0700. Wendy, over to you. Thanks, Gordon. Well, up next, a Hindu family who risked death just for a couple pots of water. Find out what saved their lives in more ways than one after this. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. A Christian house church leader has been freed from prison in Iran. Pastor Ben Amirani was granted a 15 day short term release. According to Present Truth Ministries, Irani had to post a $40,000 bond to guarantee his return. Jailed twice, Pastor Benham has been in prison since April 2010. The former Muslim was convicted of committing crimes against Iranian national security. He'll be required to return to prison July 19th after visiting his wife and children for the first time in over four years. CBN's Orphan's Promise is helping provide clean drinking water to children in Ukraine. For months now, many children have been living in, in a war zone in eastern Ukraine without adequate access to water. Working with a local church on the ground, Orphans Promise dug a well to supply them with life-giving water. Teams have also been providing food, clothing, and other relief materials. Orphans Promise is offering continued support to children at risk in war-torn eastern Ukraine. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Gordon and Wendy will be back right after this.
to see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, every day a couple in India risk their lives just to get clean drinking water. Even though they were Hindus, they decided to pray to Jesus for help. And here's how their prayers were answered. As Kamala and her husband guided their livestock through the wilderness of northwest India to get water, they had to keep close watch for any signs of danger. Some of my sheep were eaten by wild animals and bitten by poisonous snakes. There were times that we had to run for our lives, leaving our animals behind. And we did all of this just to get a few pots of water. Then a pastor came to their village. He prayed with Kamala and her husband and encouraged them to put their faith in Jesus Christ for an answer. Even though we were Hindu, we decided to pray to Jesus for clean drinking water close to our home. Soon, CBN came to our village and drilled for water. By the grace of God, water gushed out and every villager was filled with joy. That's when we knew Jesus was real and he heard our prayers. So my entire family accepted Jesus as our personal savior. The well has brought peace to Kamala's family and a hundred other families in their village. We no longer have to be afraid of wild animals attacking us while getting water. And since we can quickly get the water, we can spend more time farming and making enough to raise our children. We thank God and CBN so much for making this possible. And we thank you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you made that possible because a portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing, and another portion goes into the work of CBN International to help people around the world. If you want to be a part of it, just call us and say, yes, I want to join. Number's on the screen, 1-800-759-0700. How much is it? It's just $20 a month. That's just 65 cents a day. And you join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world today. So if that's you, give us a call. And with your pledge, we'll send you the Transforming Word, latest DVD, CD teaching from my father, Verses for Health and Healing. And the reason it's a two-pack DVD and CD, CD is the DVD is a video teaching, and then the CD, you can listen to Bible verses in your car. There's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And when you have the Word being put into your life, it builds you up spiritually. So that's why we've done it this way. It's yours when you join. So call us, 1-800-759-0700. Wendy? All right, well, coming up, a small business owner who's both a skater and a mentor. We're not just offering paychecks. But whatever it is they end up doing, a work ethic that says, I'm not done until the job's done, that's universally applicable. The founder of the Salem Town Board Company talks about the unique way he's helping his city right after this. One week from today, we're going to be featuring the hope, and it's going to be every day for two weeks, uh, all the various stories that are in this wonderful DVD. Uh, get informed about how Israel started. It's the hope, the rebirth of Israel. The title comes from the national anthem of Israel, Hatikva, which translated into English means the hope. And we want you to be informed so that you can understand today's headlines. Uh, when you hear Palestinians talking about boycotting, divestment, sanctions against Israel, uh, get the real reason why, why, why they've, they want to do this, why they've never accepted uh, a Jewish state in Palestine. Uh, get the history, understand the people involved. Uh, it all starts on July 20th. That's one week from today, right here on the 700 Club. Wendy? That trailer looks like a major motion picture is coming. I mean, well, I'm very glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want to see it. It looks amazing. Yeah, I've, uh, I've watched the Blu ray check disc over the weekend, and uh, I'm excited Pretty for good. it. Pretty good. How long is it? Uh, the total thing, total package is an hour 49 minutes. So it is a minute, major motion so picture. It's a full length <laughs> documentary. documentary. There's some bonus features on Winston Churchill. 
there's also more about how uh, the Jews started buying the land way back in 1860 and how they, they progressed through time. But the major portion is focused on the biographies of Herzl, right. uh, Heim Weizmann, um, David Ben-Gurion, and Golda Meir. Wow. Uh, with All another things. feature on Winston Churchill, his impact on, on the whole process. Uh, it's wonderful history, and you, you can get informed. All right. Sounds wonderful. Okay. Well, ask the people at the Salem Town Board Company about what they do, and they'll tell you they do two things. They build handmade skateboards and hopefully build a better community in the process. Before moving to the Salem Town neighborhood, um, in 2012, I was going to seminary in the Boston area. At the time, I was single, debt-free, and theologically educated. And um, I was really wrestling with what is, what is my next step. I had a group of friends that I grew up with, guys that I went to youth group with, that I played in bands with, even though I didn't know what was gonna happen when I moved to Nashville. Just knowing that I had a community here was kind of the, the thing that really pushed me to, to come. I grew up skateboarding. I grew up making ramps in the driveway. Uh, I, I always loved doing woodworking stuff. I've always kind of had a creative streak and like building and, and the company kind of allows me to do all those different things. So the, the name Salem Town Board Co. comes from the neighborhood that we're in. It is a tough neighborhood just north of Nashville. It's, it's our desire to use employment uh, and to use the context of this small business to be discipling, to be evangelizing, um, and to be training these young men what it means to be men. Because I, I don't think that you can be a godly young man. I don't think you can be a godly father. I don't think you can be a godly husband without having the concept of what it is to show up at work, do things you don't want to do because you need to do it. And those are, those are life skills that whether these young men end up owning their own skateboard companies, whether they grow up to be uh, finished carpenters or accountants or CPAs or you know whatever it is they end up doing, uh, an eye for detail and a work ethic that says, I'm not done until the job's done, that's universally applicable. Being their employer, being a boss, it's like there's a psychological shift that happens where I'm able to, to say things and speak to areas that if I was just a well-intentioned guy who was a regular in the neighborhood, they, they would totally brush it off. Um, but when I sit down with my, one of my employees and I say, you know, tell me what you think about pot use or tell me about you know, your relationships with young women, tell me about how you treat your mom, tell me about what you believe fundamentally about family or faith. Uh, I'm able to, to speak to these things with authority and weight. I'll watch 15, 16, 17 year olds for the first time in their life say things like, oh, when I grow up, I want to be blank. Like, I just, I just assumed that everybody did that when they were little. Beyond just seeing that hope cultivated within our employees, we've been able to have the joy of baptizing one of our employees. Uh, that, was, that was a great day. I, I cried a lot. We've been able to go to one of our employees' graduations and, and see him walk across the stage and get his diploma. We're not just offering paychecks. Like we, we, are, we are addressing that need because we believe that as Christians, like that's a need here. People need jobs. And so as Christians, we need to be providing employment. It is a need for young men to know what it means to be a man. And so we are here striving to provide that example. Uh, but all of that happens in and under the umbrella of the gospel. I want every non-believing employee that I have to be able to tell me what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Even if they don't believe it, whether God is calling you to move to a place where nobody looks like you for the sake of doing something that there's not really a template for in order to see Jesus made much of in a community that right now you know nothing about, or whether he's calling you to uh, live a life that looks a lot like other people in terms of career path, etc. We are all called to die to ourselves to see Christ made much of. I don't want anyone to ever hear about what we're doing or hear me talk about what we're doing and to feel like if they're not doing something you know, radical, uh, that they're not within God's plan for their life. There are no Christian superheroes. Jesus calls every Christian to take up their cross and follow him. Great story. Well, coming up, a man whose arthritis was crippling both of his hands and his wallet. 
It slowed me down on the job. As a small contractor, you can't afford to hire people. So I was looking at folding the business down. Watch how he got the relief he needed without medicine or surgery. That's next. Ted Warnix is a handyman who couldn't use his hand. Crippling arthritis kept him in excruciating pain most of the day. Ted needed help, and he got it one day after turning on the 700 Club. Ted Wernicks has always depended on his hands to make a living. I'm a remodeling contractor and uh, still swing a hammer and uh, all the other tools along with it. Then in 2013, he started having excruciating pain in his right hand. I couldn't close this knuckle. The first knuckle was hurting me so bad. I went to the doc and then of course they just said, well, here's some ibuprofen, get used to it. They got different uh, drugs for pain, but there's no cure for it. They didn't x-ray it, but they checked it out and it was swollen and he said, well, it's arthritis. The pain became so intense, he had a hard time doing his job. Gripping some of the tools was difficult. It slowed me down on the job, you know. I have to rely on other people to do some of the work. As a small contractor, you can't afford to hire people. So I was looking at folding the business down. While at home one day in October of that year, Ted happened to see the 700 Club. I'd finished stoking the fire, and I started to walk through the living room here, and Terry was on and said, When else you have arthritis in your hands, like your, your joints just ache, and it's so difficult for you to just do household tasks. God he is healing that for you right now. I said, that's for me. And I took that as me and sat down and went in prayer with her. He touched me, and it was healed instantly. I went, wow. This is sweet, and thank you, Father. Ted says he hasn't had any pain in his hand since, and the healing strengthened his faith in God. He keeps me going. Every time I've been hurt, uh, he, he's healed me several times and keep me right on going. He's healed me several times. Lots of us can have that same report. I know that's happened to me. God wants to heal his children. Just get that straight. You don't have to argue with him. You don't have to bargain with him. Just understand that he's a heavenly father who loves you. Now, if you have children and one of them is sick, what do you do? Do you, do you ignore it? No. You take them to doctors. You take them to whatever is needed so that they could get better. Well, our heavenly father loves us infinitely. So he wants to do whatever is needed to get us whole. He wants us to have these things. He wants us to be healed. Just as our souls prosper, he wants us to prosper in everything, in our bodies, in our minds. He wants us whole. And that's why he sent Jesus. By his stripes, we were healed. That's what the Bible says. By his stripes, we were healed. It's already happened. When were your sins forgiven? Well, they were forgiven 2,000 years ago, before you even committed them. When were you healed? Same time, same event, by his stripes. Now, Jesus gave some keys to miracles. You find it in the Gospel of Mark in the 11th chapter, where his disciples were amazed that he had spoken a word to a tree and it had been withered from the root. And he explains faith to them. And he says, if you even have a little bit of faith, just a mustard seed, you can do this. And what are the key? Believe in your heart that you have already received and you will have it. So often we think in our heart that it's some far off thing, that God's far away from us, even though in him we live and move and have our being. So have his presence right now, and he is enthroned in our praises, not in our complaints. He's enthroned in our praises. So realize that we're gathered together. Wendy and I are here, you're here, and Jesus says when two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. So he's right here. 
We don't have to shout for it. He's right here. He can hear. Now believe. Believe. Look to the cross and believe. It's already finished. It's already taken care of. He's already taken away this pain. And in that belief, come to him with your point of need. Now, I believe faith is an act. So in an act of faith, right now, just lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. And Wendy and I are going to come into agreement. And just like that story you just saw, God's going to speak. He's going to speak, and he can and will speak directly to you. And as he speaks, just take that and say, this is for me. This is my miracle. This is what Jesus died for. I'm the prize he died for. And realize it's for you. It's not some far off thing. It's for you. And it's for you right now. So we're going to agree. We're going to pray. Join with us and just believe. Now lay that hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Let's do this all together. And Jesus will do the rest. Let's pray. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And as people are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, mm -hmm. we come into agreement with them. Yes. And we claim your word. If two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. So we agree and we touch and we believe and we look to your sacrifice and we say by the stripes, I am healed now in Jesus' name. I receive it. I receive his presence in my body now. And I ask that everything be restored, everything be renewed, and all pain leave now in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's someone you're laying your hand on your right knee and you've had a terrible wrench in it. Uh, you felt something uh, tear and it's swollen and God is healing it right now. In Jesus name, that pain is leaving you. The swelling is going to go down gradually, but now the pain is gone. Mm -hmm. So in Jesus name, get up and do what you couldn't do before. Begin to move that joint and realize God has healed you. Wendy? There's a man and you've had back pain for about five years and it's really been uh, painful at times and the Lord's healing you today. And you just get up and stretch and just praise the Lord because you are healed. Uh, there's someone you've had a, a diagnosis of a tumor in your, in your brain and it's on the right side and in the right frontal lobe, right behind your forehead. And God's touching it right now. You're just feeling a burning sensation go into it, and it's leaving you now. Go back and get retested and be amazed at what God has done for you. If you've been touched by God, we want to share in your good report, so call us, 1-800-759-0700. We leave you these words from John 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 